associated with that, that idea in many religious systems all throughout the world, throughout all history, Sodom and Gomorrah, synonymous with impenitent sin. And their destruction have been commonly regarded as a manifestation of divine retribution. The Bible mentions that the cities were destroyed for their sins. Sodomy, haughtiness or arrogance, and egoism, you know, fullness of bread and just everything going well with them to the exclusion of God in their thoughts. And so Sodom and Gomorrah have been used historically and in modern discourses also as metaphors for homosexuality. And in fact, these names of these two former cities are the origin of the English words today, which you'll hear like sodomite, you've heard that word, which is a, a pejorative term for male homosexuality and sodomy, which is used in a legal context also, even in, in, in legal you know, settings, laws, crimes against human nature in the legal literature is referred to as sodomy. And this is based upon explanation of the biblical text, interpreting judgment upon these cities as punishments for their sins. In fact, some Islamic societies even incorporate punishment associated with Sodom and Gomorrah into their legal code. It's called Sharia law. You know, so it's become a metaphor for many things. And so, you know, in the cities, everybody has heard at some point or another about Sodom and Gomorrah. But what we're primarily interested in this morning is how these cities were destroyed. What was God's rule, if any, in their destruction? You see, the default interpretation of almost all religious systems is that because of their sinfulness, God finally got angry. He couldn't take it anymore. He got to the end of his rope, as the expression is used. He finally got angry and poured upon these cities fire and brimstone, brimstone out of heaven. That is the default interpretation. God using his mighty power to do something to eradicate these cities off the map because he got angry of what was happening in these cities. We want to really see what God's role was in all of this and how God relates in all of these situations where we're seeing judgments coming upon cities, upon peoples, and upon, you know, all throughout time. Because the same principles apply and explain these things which are so often misunderstood in the scriptures. So, as the prophet Isaiah once said, come let us reason together. Now, the cities, these cities are first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 10, 19. It says, and the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest unto Gerar, unto Ge Ge Gaza, Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboim, and even unto Lasha. So even unto Lasha. So we see at least four of these cities mentioned here. There were actually five of them that were involved in this destruction. Five. But we see at least four of them mentioned here. Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam and Zeboim, the ones that are highlighted. Now, yeah, even though Sodom and Gomorrah are the ones that are widely known by everyone that were destroyed in that cataclysm 4,000 years ago, approximately. Four of them are mentioned here. Now, five cities we read in Genesis 14, 1. This is an account of Abraham's experience. During the time of Abraham, when Sodom and Gomorrah came under attack, Sodom and Gomorrah and these other cities, the five cities, we'll see them mentioned here in a few times, maybe two or three different verses. And they, they, some enemies came and they came together. They attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities. And Lot, Abraham's nephew, who was living in Sodom and Gomorrah, was taken captive also, taken prisoner and taken with them. And Abraham came and, with his, and heard that his nephew Lot was captured and taken. And Abraham with his 318 men, I guess Abraham was quite a young man that time and had some energy. They jumped on their camels or whatever they rode back then. And they went after them and they tracked them down after, I guess, a few days. And they caught up with them and they routed them at night. They routed them and took back, rescued Lot and his family, rescued all the spoils that were taken and came back and gave it back to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the king of Sodom and all these, gave him back all his wealth, his gold, everything, and Abraham took none of it. And 
Abraham said, I don't want it because I don't want you to think that you've made me rich. My dependence is upon God. But nevertheless, we see, this is just from account, that Solomon and Gomorrah, these cities were existing during the time of Abraham, and we see them mentioned here. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of China, Ariel, king of Elassar, Shedalomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, that's one of the cities, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shem, Shemiber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. So Bela is also called Zor, which is the fifth one of these cities. And all these were joined together in the Vale of Sidim. I highlighted these things because we want to understand. We're going to see these words again, Vale of Sidim, this expression, which is the Salt Sea. So the Salt Sea was located in the area called the Vale of Sidim. It says here, and there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, the same is Zor, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidim. And there went out, okay, I got that twice. All right, let's go to verse 10. And the vale of Sidim was full of slime pits. I highlighted that again. Keep that word in mind, slime pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. They got trapped in that area where there were slime pits. All right. Now, Abraham went on the rescue and rescued Lot and whatever. Now let's look at the cities again. In relation to the salt sea, which we're seeing here in a picture. Genesis 13, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Solomon and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor, which as we saw is Bela. No, so there was a time when it was a, a prosperous area. It was a fruitful place. There was a time when it, you know, at one point, and that was a time when Lot decided to go there. So here we are encountering them in Genesis 13. Chapter 1 to 13 talks, gives us more information about, I mean, chapters, verses 1 to 13 of Genesis 13. And this is in connection with the separation between Abraham and his nephew Lot, who they had journeyed together when they left Abraham's home country where he started from, from Ur of the Chaldees in the land of, Can when they went to the land of Canaan. And they came to a point where the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot started quarreling. Their cattle had multiplied significantly and they were now fighting over the, 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 the land for where to, you know, to graze their cattle, graze their herds, their sheep or whatever it was that they had. And it says here in verse 11, then Lot, Abraham said to Lot, Lot, just choose whatever want you want. If you want to choose the hills, I will go to the flat. If you want to choose the flat, I will go to the hills. Just choose and we have to be separated now for the sake of peace between us. Abraham gave him the choice. Lot took what seemed to be the best part of the land. He went to the plain because it was flat and level and grassy and I guess easier for, the, for his herds to graze. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So there was a separation, and Lot chose the this, this level of the plains. And in those plains, they were Sodom. We see a little, a little picture, a little kind of graphic here, which shows Zeboim, the relation of these cities to the salt sea that we see mentioned in Genesis chapter 14. Up top here is Zeboim, then Adma, Gomorrah, Sodom, and Zor, or Bela, to the bottom here. We're just giving a little, we're just giving context right now by giving a little geographical reference for context's sake. All right. Let's, we continue looking at the cities. So the five cities destroyed were Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zor. All right, five cities that were destroyed. Now, all these were positioned in proximity to what we now know as the Dead Sea. 
It's the same one that's called the salt sea that we read about in Genesis 14. It is dead because it's not conducive to supporting life due to the very high concentrations of salt in this water. Nothing grows there. So, in other words, Brother Alvin, you don't go fishing at the Dead Sea unless you're fishing for salt. The Dead Sea. And it's that, in that region that these cities were located. Now, other biblical reference to Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and you know, usually it mentions only Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah, but in general, it's really five cities that were included in the destruction that took them out. Ezekiel 16, 48 and 49, as I live, says the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So I guess Sodom was the bigger city, the, mo the most prosperous metropolis of the five. And all the other ones probably referred to as her daughters or whatever. God is saying to his people, look, you are worse than Sodom and Gomorrah were. Verse 50, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Notice the punitive language. I took them away. And as we saw earlier on, God it says God rained on fire from, and brimstone from heaven. Really, the typical way of thinking, the spontaneous way of thinking is, okay, God got angry and destroyed them and just zapped them with some divine power. Bringing down fire and brimstone some mysterious things that are flammable and wipe them out. But we want to look beyond the, 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 the kind of mysterious applications that people apply to these things and see that the Bible is written in such a way as to communicate to us certain thoughts, but we must understand the way the Hebrews express themselves. Because they typically express themselves where God, where, whenever they're talking about judgments coming upon people or upon nations, and God's role in it is typically represented in a causative tense, as if God did it directly, causative, when in reality it's merely in a, it should be in a permissive tense, wherein God actually withdrew and permitted sin to run its course. We need to keep that in mind. But in the meantime, let's look at some other biblical references to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. In the New Testament, now we see Luke 17, 28 to 29. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Notice it's saying the fire and brimstone is coming from heaven. Okay, so God must have a lot of brimstone in heaven. Heaven is supposed to be a place then which has probably mines and mines of brimstone. What is brimstone? We will see. Because there's no such thing as brimstone in heaven. This is just the way the ancient writers wrote in expression of whatever, you know, they express everything in that sense. Whatever, whenever it comes to destruction or calamity, rain don't fire, lightning flashes, Fire comes down from heaven. Jude chapter, Jude verse 7. It's one chapter, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So we're seeing that there are many places and there are others too in which Sodom and Gomorrah are referenced in the Bible. Now, let's look at some events leading up to the destruction. Genesis 18 now, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him, that is unto Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So this is around noontime, the heat of the day. And Abraham is chilling out, we would say today, by his tent in the shade in the plains of Mamre. This was some years after Lot had separated and moved his family to Sodom. And was living there and being very prosperous. He had daughters. His daughters had grown up and they had gotten married. And they were living in Sodom. And life was good, I, I, I suppose, at least to all appearances, to Lot and his family. So Abraham is now chilling now. He's there and he sees some men appear. But the Bible tells us that it's the Lord who appeared unto him. And the word Lord here means Yahweh. This is the, this is the Lord accompanied by two angels who visits Abraham in the plains of Mamre and spends some time with Abraham and his wife and repeats to them the promise of a son. 
we can see this in verses 1 to 15 and you know he goes on in chapter i'm sorry of chapter 18 of genesis and so the lord appeared to him abraham sees this person he doesn't appear come as if he's the lord he just impersonates like just a regular human being and he's passing by with two other men so it's like three men passing but abraham because of his innate hospitality abraham had that built in sin you know hospitality that was a part of his nature and abraham don't is not going to see three strangers passing in a hot day and not inviting them in for some food and to wash their feet and some cool drink at least and so and he lifts up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him and when he saw them he ran to meet them so they were a little way off coming in, like in that direction like they would be passing close by and he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself towards the ground this was traditional eastern hospitality and he said my lord the lord here he doesn't know who he's talking to yet but my lord is an expression of seeing someone who seems to have a regal bearing and you realize that there is some measure of importance to them and you're addressing them in a polite way which was typical of the cultures of that time and he said my lord if now i have found favor in thy sight pass not away i pray thee from thy servant let a little water i pray you be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree so Abraham invited them in. He sent someone to catch a fatted calf. He <laughs> had a calf butchered and prepared a meal for them. And they ate and drank and he washed their feet. He had his servants wa wash their feet and everything. That was the hospitality of the time. You know, and um, Abraham at that time thought he was just showing hospitality to three regular men. But this was Christ and two angels, naturally Gabriel and another angel. So they are there, and then after they're there, enjoying Abraham's hospitality, they, then he repeats the promise of a son to them, and they laughed, the wife laughed, and then, then he revealed to them, by, because if he knew what we were thinking, they realized, that, hold on, this is a divine being we're talking to. And so now the Lord sets out towards Sodom, and Abraham accompanies him. You know, the group accompanies the group part of the way. And the Lord announces his reason for visiting Sodom. He said, it's because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is very great. And because their sin is very grievous. We see this in verses 20 to 21 of Genesis 18. Their cry is very great. Their sin is very grievous. And we wonder about the nations around us today. The nations that we live in and those all around I wonder what God is saying about them not today. The same thing, probably, that their cry is, come up to me. They're, they're very grievous. They're sins. When you look at all the things that are allowed to go on, and some, some of much of which is, 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 is officially, even though not made to look so officially sanctioned. You know, people in high positions that are involved in, 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 in child abduction and, 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 and even slavery is more now today than it was in, in 200 years ago. And, and, and so many things that are going on in terms of the, the, the kind of corruptions and the kind of atrocities being corrupted. I'm wondering what God is saying about them if he said it's about Sodom and Gomorrah back then. But nevertheless, this is what he said to, to Abraham. And so Abraham interceded for Sodom in response, you know, the Lord, you know, Abraham interceded. He said to the Lord, the, the Lord told him, look, they're, they're, it's, they're going to be destroyed. And Abraham said, but Lord, what if there are 50 righteous? And the Lord said, if there are 50 righteous, then that gives me legal right to preserve them. They won't be destroyed. I will avert the destruction. They, I, won't, I, won't, they, I won't destroy them. And then Abraham scratches his head, but what if it's 49 or 48? That's not 50. And he says, Lord, please let me, I, forgive me for, for you know, being, you know, arguing, but please, what if there are 45? The Lord said, if there are 45, they won't be destroyed. Then Abraham said, please, one more time, forgive me. What if they're 40? And then what if they're 30? And what if they're 20? And what if they're 10? And it goes right down. These are verses 22 to 32 of Genesis 18. And the Lord each time said, Abraham, okay, if there are 10 righteous ones, that I won't destroy the city. In other words, that gives me the right to remain and I will preserve the city. And, and so that was it. God was there allowing a Simple mortal, that's Christ pre-incarnate. Christ before he came to earth. 
as, as you know, taking on our humanity, manifested himself many times to the, the, the patriarchs and the prophets of the Old Testament. And this was the creator of everything who was allowing a puny, sinful, fallen man to bargain with him. And Christ was looking for every possible reason to prevent the destruction. He was saying, Abraham, no matter. But then he got to the point where not even that could be found because 10 people were not taken out of the city. So that was the events as they were developed. But let's look at developments regarding the condition of the cities at that time, reflecting the condition of the cities. Abraham is there talking with Christ, and Christ is seeking for every possible reason to prevent the destruction. He says, look, even though he already knew what's going to happen, he said, Abraham, look, even if there are 10, the cities won't be destroyed. And the two angels went on to the cities. So these two angels enter Sodom and Lot invites them to his house. We see this in Genesis 19. Now we're following the narrative. Now we're in chapter 19, verses one to three. Lot invites them to his house. Apparently, Lot had learned something about hospitality from his time spent with his uncle Abraham. So Lot had an uncle Abraham and he had learned hospitality from Abraham apparently. And the angels enter the city. Lot invites them to his house because he knew the condition of the city even though he lived there. He lived there very quite comfortably and, but he knew what he was living amongst. And the men of Sodom came and they pressured Lot to send out the angels so they can lie with them. And Lot refuses and even offers his two virgin daughters instead. I mean, it's as if Lot was thinking, well, at least that is according to the natural order, as opposed to two of the same gender. Whatever he was thinking, I'm not a mind reader, but we can deal with that another time. But Lot refuses. He sees these as strangers and he would not compromise his hospitality by allowing them to be treated, these two strangers, this way. He didn't know they were angels yet. But the men of Sodom threatened to harm, threatened to harm Lot and tried to break down his door to get at the angels. And the scripture says the angels pull Lot into the house and smite the Sodomites with blindness. That too is a statement that we need to understand how that is done. Because God's power is never directly used to inflict harm. So whenever we see it is expressed as if it's direct infliction of harm by the use of the divine power through his angels, it means a withdrawal. Because as we saw last night, in a world that is collapsing, not only the geosystems around us are collapsing, not only the elemental structure of, of the building blocks of, of nature are collapsing, but our very own bodies are collapsing. That's why we age, we get sick. We are constantly deteriorating and getting older and dying. We're in a state, we're born and we start dying. And, but it's only being slowed down and held back we preserve, we slow down. The process is significantly slowed down by the power of God. So in whatever era there is, in for this case, God preserves our heart, keeps it beating. He preserves our liver to keep it flushing toxins from our bodies. He preserves our kidneys, keep them filtering the blood and flushing out, absorbing and reabsorbing necessary nutrients that went out and, and all the different systems of the body. So to whatever extent God withdraws from any aspect of our physical or biological being, that physiology suffers. So God now left them in confusion by removing that preserving grace that enabled them to see. And blindness doesn't mean that their eyes necessarily physically were blinded, like their eyes were closed. It meant that they were left in confusion where they couldn't even see. Just like in 1 Kings 6, when the soldiers came to Elisha, and Elisha said, Lord, um, and they, they were delivered into Elijah's hand and he said they were blinded and yet Elijah led them, a whole army, and led them in the middle of the city and, and then their sight was just, not like they were physically blind. They were just not aware. They, they couldn't, they were, they were confused. They couldn't see. Physically, they might be able to see through their eyes, but being totally unaware of where they were. That's another thing to look at another time. But anyway, Lot, the angels pulled Lot in because the men wanted to just rip him to pieces. And then Lot realized that he's dealing with divine beings. But this encounter shows the extent of Sodom's degradation. They had passed the boundary of their probation. The wickedness of the city had reached its 
peak, the cup of their iniquity was full. Do you remember Abraham in his discourse with Christ? He said, look, their cry has come up to me and their sins have reached to high heaven. So it shows the conditions that were, which reflects the conditions that were in the city that were prevailing. Now the verdict, destruction is decreed. Lot was told by the angels to get his relatives out of the city. So the men said to the angels said to Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, whatever you have in the city, bring them out of this place. So we see that even at this 11 hour, 11.5, 11 11.99 hour, God is still seeking to save any that were salvageable. Any apart from your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law, Lord, think, you know any? Get them out. Tell them to get out right now. He says, for we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Notice again the causative language, the punitive language, as if the destruction will be a direct act from God through his angels. Notice again, we want to understand and make these things very clear how the Bible is written. So notice that they are attributed a causative rather than a permissive role. That's how the Hebrews wrote in these matters. All right? Note, so in accordance with the Hebrew idiom of permission, which we've talked about many times, which was the customary way of expressing things, that is how it's expressed here. God's rule is written in the sense of causative or directly doing it rather than stepping back and allowing it to happen, allowing sin to run its natural course. I mean, for example, it's a wonderful book that I, that I um, want to try to spend some time in every now and again. Figures of speech used in the Bible, E.W. Bullinger. It says in page 823, it says, active verbs were used by the Hebrews to express not the doing of a thing, but the permission of the thing which the agent is, agent is said to do. So in other words, when it says God destroyed them, it means God allowed them to be destroyed. It means he stepped back, and as the Bible uses the expression sometimes, he hid his face or he turned his face away from them. It means that he delivered them up or gave them up. He no longer prevented the things around them that would break forth into destruction. He removed his restraint from these things and allowed sin to run its natural course of cause and effect. In fact, that is what the statement says. The Young's translation of the Bible, Young's Living Translation, also in its, you know, its introductory sections, it has a section called Helpful, Help, Helpful Hints for Bible Interpretation. And hint number 70, 70B, 70A and there's 70B, it says active verbs imply permission. So this is something which is commonly known that often it said, God destroyed them or we will destroy the angels of God destroyed them. It means that they stepped back and allowed the destruction to take place. They no longer held it back. That's what it really means. They permitted it in, as opposed to actively doing it. Now, Lot know, as the angel said, try to find your family, anybody you know, tell him to get out of the city immediately. So Lot is pleading in vain with his sons-in-law. His daughters were married to the, to, um, to, to men of Sodom. It says, and Lot went out and spoke unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But notice, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-law. They were saying like, oh, this man is crazy. You look at the city, look how nice it is. Look how nice it is here in Miami or Los Angeles or, you know, you name any of those beautiful cities over here in Aventura by the beach. And there are many others. Destroy your crazy. That can never happen. Look, how, like, look through the window lot. Look how beautiful the sun is shining. Look how beautiful a day it is. It, by the way, I think he went to them at the night. In the night, he went to them. He didn't wait till the morning. He went to knock on their doors. He said, get out. They said, come on, lot. Do you need to see how things are nice in the city? Are you crazy? He said he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-law. I'm thinking he must be going off his head. Nevertheless, they decided that this man is crazy. We're not going anywhere. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters. I guess the two that were not married to men in Sodom. They were not married. Take your wife and two daughters, which are here, 
lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So the clock was ticking and the angels have a sense of urgency. They're saying, Lot, it's coming. Let's get out of here quickly. And notice he hesitated. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him outside the city. They're saying, Lot, you're, you're hesitating. Lot, it's going up in flames. Get out. Lot is kind of scratching his head and thinking, I wonder. What the... the angels laid hold on him and said, and took, brought them outside the city. So you can understand, by the way, his hesitation, of course. These are his daughters. And if they don't believe and act now, he knows he will never see them again, the ones who are married. But there is a point at which even sentimentality must give way to reason. A point at which the line is drawn and husband has to say to wife and wife has to say to husband or parents to children or children to parents or sibling to sibling, look, if you choose to stay, then that's up to you. But I'm out of here. There's a point at which sentimentality must give way to reason. And so they were urged to escape. The angels took them out. Lot made a little compromise. The angels told Lot, escape for your life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. They said, Lot, go up to the mountain. But upon Lot's plea, verses 18 to 22 tells us that Lot begged them. And upon Lot's plea, the angels allow him to shelter in Zor, which as we saw earlier is Bela. Now, Lot realized later on when he saw the cities, other cities up top going up in flames and it's moving in his direction. And he said, hold on, it's coming this way. He realized later on, he said, it's not safe. So he eventually abandoned Zor and went to the mountains. But he pled with the angels. The angels knew that Zor or Bela was going to go up too. But notice this, whenever men insist that this is what we want to do, what does God do? God says, okay, have it your way. So the angels left him in Zor. So that was Lot's compromise solution, but luckily he came to his senses and abandoned Zor and went to the mountains before it was too late. And the Bible tells us the Lord rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Genesis nineteen twenty four. He overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants and the vegetation. Verse 25 tells us that of Genesis 19. Lot's, life, Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt, verse 26. And it says, the smoke of the burning went up like the smoke of a furnace, verse 28. All right. So that's the, 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 the historical narrative in a gist of it, actually. Just a concise gist of the whole narrative, picking at certain points. And now what we're going to be doing from this point forward is we are going to be examining the evidence. That's what we're going to do from here, examining the evidence. By the way, this picture here is a picture from what it looks like today in that area, parts of that area over there where these cities were back in those days. That's kind of like an area it looks like today. Now let's start with brimstone. It says the cities were destroyed with fire and brimstone. These were the elements by which the cities were destroyed, we're told, at least what the Bible mentions, fire and brimstone. Now, when people read of brimstone in the Bible, they immediately think of something destructive coming down from heaven. Instead of something destructive which occurs naturally in the earth of this fallen world. Notice, brimstone are brimstones, these are highly concentrated masses of sulfur present in the form of what is called today bitumen or sulfur. So if you've ever struck a match before, if you've ever lit a match before, it means you've handled brimstone. Brimstone is sulfur. It doesn't need to come from heaven. It occurs naturally in the rocks in, and in the earth in many different regions of the world. Deuteronomy 29 and verse 23, Moses writing, Moses says, speaking of that area. So 
Moses later on is describing the area where Sodom and Gomorrah lay, where those cities were. And Moses is writing roughly 400 years after the destruction of these cities. He's speaking of that geographical region, and he says that an unusually high amount of brimstone and salt is found in that land. Remember, that's the land of the salt sea, the Dead Sea. So don't miss that. Deuteronomy 29, 23 says, and that the whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning that is not sown nor bear it nor any grass grows there like the overthrow of Solomon and Gomorrah, Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. All right. So notice that he says that land is not good for farming because nothing grows there anymore. He also says it has a lot of salt. Hmm. Lot's wife, huh? Hint. She was turned into salt according to what some believe. But let's go further. He also states that there is burning in the land. What do you suppose that is talking about? It's talking about thermal activity, underground volcanic activity in the area. Now remember that brimstone is sulfur, a substance that's found in the earth. It's an ignition agent used by households all around the world. But let's go further. Above here, at the left, is brimstone with a burned, hardened shell that has the unburned sulfur inside. Next to it is brimstone without a burned shell. So that area in the soil, archaeologists go, they dig, they excavate, and even to this day, there is brimstone in the soil high concentrations of sulfur in that area. Brimstone is found in many parts of the world, but the sulfur that's found here, there are different levels of concentrations found in different parts of the world. One of the highest concentrations in terms of the volatility of the sulfur that is in this region of the world is one of the highest. Below you find a shell or a capsule of with unburned sulfur inside. It's in the rocks, it's all around that area. Biblical archeologists, many have done excavations over in that area. What we're seeing here is brimstone being collected by an archeologist in one of his digs. And according to one archeologist who have worked the area and excavated around that area, did years of excavation in the area, he said, accordingly, we have found the absolute proof that we have finally located Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain. Now, these sulfur balls are roughly around the size of a golf ball, and some have burn marks all around them, according to what the, you know, the, 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 the evidence is there, the reports are there, the archaeological reports are there from all the different excavations that have been done. And to this day, matter of fact, this is one area that I'm hoping, I'm, well, I'm not really hoping much, but if I had a chance, I would love to go look at this area. I'd love to take a trip. Maybe, Brother Joel, you can probably start planning something like that and getting us together, see who wants to go take a look at, visit this area and look at biblical history in its fulfillment and its aftermath a few thousand years after. Okay. But, <laughs> all right. I, I like exploration like these. Brimstone with a burn ring. We see it on the upper left. That white substance is a high concentrated sulfur. That's brimstone. In other, another area down below, you see, we found, this is what the archaeologists are saying, we found sulfur crystals, which are a, a remnant of the fully consumed brimstone. What left over after the brimstone has burnt out. The brimstone we're told that is found here is 96 to 98 percent sulfur, which is one of the highest, the different concentrations in different parts. Over here, it's just a high concentration of brimstone, and it's in the soil. And it has, they, they, they did their testing, and say it has trace amounts of magnesium also when you, and, uh, uh, you know, when you have that combined with sulfur, it creates an extremely high temperature burn. A chemist will tell you that when you burn sulfur with a certain measure of magnesium, it creates a higher temperature burn. And you find traces of magnesium also in the rocks with a brimstone. So, you know, so 
typically some places you'll find brimstone in the world of sulfur that's like 40% concentration of sulfur, 40% sulfur. Here it's 96 to 98. No, we find ash remains of former dwellings in the area, in that area. They go and they touch these walls and they just crumble to dust as if it was a very high intense burn that just left shells standing that were just standing ash, like something that happened instantly in, in, and rapidly. Now, another thing is petroleum. Let's look at petroleum and its byproducts. Genesis eleven thirteen 13 says, and they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Remember we saw in Genesis 14 that when the kings rushed away in Sodom, they went to the slime pits and they fell. Slime was something that was used, they had for mortar. In building, it's, it's, it is used to hold bricks together in building. Notice again Genesis 14, 10. And the veil of Sidim was full of slime pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. Veil of Sidim. Remember that we saw earlier on. That's the same place we're talking about. It's another name for the plain of Jordan by the Dead Sea region. It is an area that is rich today in petroleum products. And, and what's that thing? That tar. It's called slime. Tar and what? Pitch the things that they use to surface the roads and all these kind of things. It's very rich in those, years, in those areas. Those are, and like in Trinidad, you'll find tar pits too and everything. And, you know, these are byproducts, petroleum byproducts, related products from that process. And it still is today in those regions and others. So rich in those areas. To this very day, you have huge amounts of petroleum that is being, you know, operations run in that area. These are oil-rich regions. Number, let, let's look at this also, combustible natural gases in the area. That area around the Dead Sea is noted for frequent emissions of explosive methane gas from the earth. Geologists have found huge quantities of oil and natural gases in the ground at the southern end of the Dead Sea. Methane, which is one of the most volatile. It's a far more powerful. It's what's called one of the greenhouse gases. And it emits from the bottom of lakes where there is dead organic vegetarian for years and years. And it forms, it, it emits methane, happens in places of, of the world. In um, like, for example, in parts of Africa, in parts of Antarctica, there's methane. There's, on the news, no methane is coming up from certain parts of the certain holes, openings in the earth in Antarctica. In Siberia, methane is coming up from the earth. In the African wetlands in certain parts, methane is coming up. And these are places that are being monitored because of the explosive potential of these things. It's an odorless, colorless gas, highly volatile. In fact, it's said to be one of the more powerful greenhouse gases, which is 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide in terms of this volatility and its explosive ability. And look, just a few years ago, Israel announced discovery of very rich gas wells in the Dead Sea area. The latest well gas rich, very rich, pure, they said it's pure methane that you're using it now and trying to tap into it and use it to power their power plants and few electric plants and stuff like that. So methane, which is an explosive gas, was emitting from the earth there also, as it is in, even today in some parts of the world. Even in Pennsylvania in this country, there are some um, areas where methane is being emitted from the earth. So this is a natural phenomenon, something that happens in a fallen world. Methane. So you had petroleum, you had sulfur, you had methane, which is a flammable explosive, explosive gas. And notice what Abraham saw. Genesis nineteen twenty-eight. 28, during the destruction, it says, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. In other words, dense smoke, thick smoke. And this suggests the smoke of, a, whenever there is a petroleum based fire, when oil is burning, it gives off a thick, dense smoke as what Abraham is describing right here. The Bible records what Abraham saw. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, towards the land of the plain, and he saw this dense smoke coming up. This, this, look, this is what it looked like when the Gulf War, when over in Kuwait, when the oil was burning a few years ago when they had the Gulf War. This is what it looks like. 
kind of like what Abraham was seeing. Smoke rising like from a furnace. It indicates that there's a forced draft, such as something that you'd expect if there's subterranean deposits of, of, of gas or petroleum products and it's being forced out of the ground under pressure. Abraham stood in the mountains, he looked, and that was kind of like what he saw happening in those cities. It speaks of tar or slime, which is like tar. Exodus 2 and verse 3. And when she could not longer hide him, she took him for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the children therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, laid the child therein. That was Moses' mother and his sister there. They put in Moses in a basket. And what did they use? The same thing that's called slime. The slime pitch, tar. Tar was plentiful and is today still plentiful and used plentifully from earliest times. Tar was used for sealing the seams of ships and also in certain medicines too back in those days. In fact, history shows that hundreds of years before Abraham, Dead Sea tar was already being traded to Egypt. They were using it in making mummies, those preserved bodies. They used tars in the sealing process also. So Egypt were exporting tar to Egypt from the Dead Sea region. So it's used to seal ships. This is something that was plentiful in that area. Where you see tar, it means petroleum is there. Genesis 6, 14, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shall thou make in the ark, shall thou pitch with it and without pitch. That's pitch. Slime refers to bitumen, Chambers 20th Century Dictionary, as the name applies to various inflammable mineral substances such as naphtha, petroleum, and asphalt. So we're looking at the, the things that, were, that are even still today plentiful in this area. In fact, Encyclopedia Britannica tells us in 1975 edition, volume 14, page 165, it says the Dead Sea was known in ancient times as Lake Asphaltitis. What does that sound like? Asphalt. It says because of the semi-solid petroleum washed up on its shores from underwater seepages. Josephus, the Jewish historian, during the first century, he wrote, even in the time of the New Testament, he was writing, Josephus reported that there were huge pieces of tar floating in the water of the Dead Sea, and these were collected by ships and sold. Wars of the Jews, volume 4, page 479. So tar was used to seal or to caulk boats so that they, water would not come into them. And the Bible says the air was full of tar pits or slime pits, Genesis 14.10. Let's look at another thing, volcanic activity. Even to this day, numerous hot springs on both sides of the Dead Sea is evidence of underground molten activity. This is a current map. In fact, you have now certain resorts. I just I realized this week that Hilton went over in that region and built a resort. Why? Because people like to go to hot springs and bathe in the mineral springs. And so a mass, Hilton built a massive resort over there because of the numerous hot springs that are under the earth that are coming up. And people from all over the world go there, stay at the Hilton and go in the, the hot springs and bask. But it shows that there's volcanic activity underground. Wherever you find hot springs coming up, volcanic activities underground. And today, this area is part of what is called the Levant Volcanic Province. This extends from Jordan all the way through Syria and to Israel. The, these, you know, these are volcanoes. And we, these, these, are different volcan these are different volcanoes today that are being identified in that area. Poria, Yavnil, Tavor, Givat, Gavit, and Tamra. These are just names of certain volcanoes in the area. So there, were vol there was volcanic activity in the area, evidence of the molten um, what, what the thing that you find there? This was a very volatile area. Let's look at something else. Earthquake activity. This is the Dead Sea here with a plate given a, a diagrammatic format of the Dead Sea area. It's just cut to give us like a three-dimensional image. These, are, these two sections of this to the right and the left are called the African and the Arabian tectonic plates. These are known today as, and they are on either sides of the Dead Sea. In other words, there were plates that, whenever you find um, 
proneness to earthquakes. You have the Earth's crust, which slides and breaks and opens up and slides when really you have volcanic activity. And right there on both either side of the Dead Sea, to the left, you over here, you have the African plate. Over here, you have the Arabian plate. These are realities that were there. In fact, you know, one British archaeologist, Graham Harris, he said that the destruction of Solomon Gomorrah was due to the outbreak of flammable methane gas and all the other things that were there in the top, the subsoil, the topsoil, the subsoil in beneath the soil. He said these were expelled by an earthquake 4,000 years ago. This, the earthquake broke the crust of the earth and these things came out. You see, this is his conclusion from going there, Graham Harris, back in 2001, he spent some time there and his, his explorations that he did there, that was his conclusion because of what he found there. Let's go on a little further. We're coming down, we're winding down. The African and Arabian plates. Let's look at earthquake activity. It has also been discovered that the area is frequently disturbed by earthquakes, even to this time, tremors and tremors. These are the perfect conditions for a major catastrophe. So this is a very unstable area. There is a high level of underground heat there, thermal activity. But let's look at one more thing. Let's look at something else. We can't finish until we look at salt. Salt in the Dead Sea region. Salt is mined there to this very day. It's common. People mine, you can see heaps of salt right there. In fact, it's all over the place. Pillars of salt all around the Dead Sea area. Mountains of salt. Huge rocks made of salt. It's popular, and you, it's not a good idea to leave your bicycle there in the water in that region. You might come back and find it totally rusted because of salt, as we see in this picture here. There is even one mount that's called Mount Sidom. At the, in other words, it's translated Jebel Udsum at the south end of the Dead Sea. They say it's composed of 50% rock salt. So how about Lot's wife? Look at salt all over the place here, just forming in crusts all over. As we saw earlier, it's called a salt sea. You know, I found this picture online. By the way, but first, let me see this. Genesis nineteen twenty six. It says, but his wife, Lot's wife, looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I found this picture online, probably computer generated, you know, but it's, it's put there by some ministry. And with it, there was a question, why did God turn Lot's wife into a pillar of salt? No, it goes to show that th that's what people typically think. God did something. God supernaturally used his power to do something. But let, let's continue looking. This is an actual rock formation, which is on a rise overlooking the Dead Sea. It's an actual picture from there to this moment. And some people say it looks like Lot's wife. <laughs> I guess it doesn't take much for some overactive imaginations to start going wild, right? But the thing is that generally, when people read Genesis 19:26. She became a pillar of salt. They are prone to envision some event of supernatural power applied in turning flesh and blood and bones and cartilage and hair into salt, which means therefore it had to be a divine work to do that. But is that what the Bible really means? In other words, they are more likely to imagine Something like God using his power to turn her body into actual salt. Maybe to teach her or to teach them a lesson for hesitating. They're more likely to see that in their imagination instead of seeing nature in a state of eruption. Salt was all around and today still is all around. Like a landslide, for example. I mean, instead of salt, why not a pillar of ice or snow? Well, if it was happening in Alaska or the Arctic Circle somewhere over there, it may have been that they would have written she turned a pillar of ice or snow, something like that. 
the point is that I'm trying to make is this, that sin works through the natural fallen environment to bring destruction upon those who are within that environment. God doesn't have to use his power to turn somebody into salt. In other words, based on how the Bible writers expressed things, if in all those eruptions there was a landslide, which is natural to happen, there are upheavals, earthquakes, everything going up into, you know, into chaos. There was a landslide and she was buried under a pile of salt. How would they write it? She turned a pillar of salt. They could see the mound and the spot where she was buried. She turned a pillar of salt. Or if it was in Alaska, maybe ice or snow. But that's the way the Bible writers wrote. It doesn't mean that God uses power under, to, to make her into salt. Understand, brethren, that divine power is never exercised to hurt. I say that again. Divine power is never exercised to hurt, but always only to heal. It is never used to destroy, but rather to create. Sin does enough destroying. It doesn't need God's help. And if that's not the case, that divine power is never used to destroy. If that's not the case, then the moment a sinner touched the sinless one, they would have been instantly destroyed. But instead, as the woman who touched even the hem of his garment, she was healed. Divine power is only moving in the direction to restore and to bring heal because bring healing because God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So this was the natural environment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Concentrated underground heat, volcanic activity. Huge quantities of explosive natural gas, methane. Huge quantities of petroleum and petroleum products, tar and the rest underground extremely high concentrations of sulfur, which is called brimstone in the Bible. And these were in the subsoil and in the rocks in these areas. In other words, brethren, these cities were sitting in a highly combustible environment. And all of these geographical, geological features are still there today as a testimony of what really happened back then. Now, how much more fire would God need to send from heaven on top of all that was already there for those cities to be destroyed? How much more would it need? It is not hard to imagine how the cities were destroyed in that highly volatile area with all these petroleum products around. All it would take to blow up the whole place is a match. The evidence points to an earthquake. As the geologists who have explored the area, many have concurred. An earthquake setting off a petroleum explosion after releasing gases, methane gas in the air. This would, and that shoots up in the air, and I mean, there's flame. When it shoots up, it shoots up in fire. This would also account for the fire in the air. The, this would also account for the bits of sulfur raining down because the explosion would send these things hundreds of feet in the air as they rain back down upon the cities in that kind of explosion. And the people would have been burned by fire or choked by the fumes. Asphalt itself, which was plentiful there, contains a very high percentage of sulfur. So this matches the evidence found in the excavations. An earthquake set off, triggered all the cities. And, and there, was, there was more than abundant evidence of burning, including even charred bones that were found in the explorations. And these were found in the cities and in areas around. And there are many pictures, I mean, you know, reports that from within recent years, within the last 100 years and less, even within the last 50 years or so of archaeological findings in the area, showing these things. So, the picture of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah should be clear then. 
The cities of the plane were located in a highly combustible and explosive environment. They were liable to go up in smoke once the right circumstances were there. The inhabitants created those circumstances by their wicked sins, which separated them from God through the removal of the protection of his restraining angels. Notice, the Bible tells us that Sodom and Gomorrah, they were spared not, but they were delivered up by God, given up. Notice the scripture which says that as we do look at our last three slides. Notice this. We're looking at, it says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, those are the ones that followed Lucifer, followed Satan, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing into the flood, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And turning, this is 2 Peter 2, 4 to 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Notice, it tells us, the angels that followed Lucifer were spared not, but delivered over. It says the people, the antediluvians at the time of Noah, they were spared not, but they were delivered up also to their destruction. It says here that Sodom and Gomorrah also, therefore, in that same context, what does it mean there? It means Sodom and Gomorrah also were spared not, but delivered up. Well, does it mean that God destroyed those cities? A resonating question, huh? Well, another text, another example will help us to understand the answer to that question. Because we're told, remember from last night's study, the sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth, how much? Every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. So we're going to go back to the light that streams from the cross of Calvary and understand what it means when it says that God spared not people who were destroyed or ended up in destruction, those who were destroyed. God spared them not, but delivered up. The cross explains all other mysteries. So let's go to the cross. Romans 8 and verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Just like Sodom and Gomorrah was spared not, but delivered up. Just like the antediluvians at the time of Noah were spared not, but delivered up. Just like the angels of, of rebelled were spared not, but delivered up. Notice this. Jesus too was spared not, but delivered up for our sins. The question is, was it the father who killed Jesus? No. He was given up to bear the consequences of sins. As we saw last night, he was destroyed by the sins of the world instigated by evil men under the control of sin and demons. So the same principle must apply. Jesus himself was spared not, but delivered up. So the father's role as it concerns the death of Christ must be similar to the father's role as it compares Sodom and Gomorrah, which also was spared not and delivered up. The antediluvians were spared not and delivered up. And all of the destructions and places and cities that were spared not and delivered up. Jesus too was spared not and delivered up. Delivered up means that he was delivered up to what? To sin, the consequence of sin, to wickedness, to evil, to the kingdom of darkness. And he faithfully bore the consequences of sin. Not something that was done to him by the father because the father suffered with his son. They were in this together. So these five cities were delivered up. 
The cities of the plain were destroyed by the explosive fire elements of their environment when sin separated them from God, producing what is described as God forsaking them, giving them up, or hiding his face from them, or it's also called God's wrath. When God separated from the son, delivering him up, Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't say, why are you killing me? He said, why have you given me up? Why have you forsaken me? Because Christ was standing in the place of the sinner, which means God's role in relation to the sinner can only be the same. It cannot be a different treatment. In every case of destruction, God has to ultimately, when minds and hearts become hardened in sin, he has to step back and deliver them up and allow sin to run its course. He is never the inflictor of harm. But he honors the choice of creatures. And God's willingness to allow Abraham to bargain with him, 50, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10, all the way down, it shows that he sought for every conceivable reason to remain with them and to avert their destruction. But he found none. And so he had to give them up. You know, in Desire of Ages, page 36, on Great Controversy, page 36, it says, God does not stand toward the sinner as the executioner of the sentence against transgression. He leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. So he's never the executioner. He doesn't stand towards the sinner as the executioner of the sentence against transgression. He steps away. You know, C.S. Lewis, Christian writer, the late C.S. Lewis, very insightful writer, he made a statement. He said, every person is required to say to God, Father, thy will be done. And for those who do not, ultimately, God will have to say to them, okay, have it your way, your will be done. Meaning that God ultimately has to give over those who will not have him, have him or have his way, give them over to their own will and to the consequences of their own choices. And that's what we see here with the case of Sodom and Gomorrah. Thank you.